Welcome to the plenary keynote three of IEEE Services 2021. I'm Rong Chen. I'm honored to introduce to you the keynote speaker, Prof Professor Amit Seth of the University of South Carolina. Amit <coughs> is an educator, researcher, and ent entrepreneur. He is the founding director of the AI Institute at the University of South Carolina. Current area of his research includes knowledge-infused learning and an explainable AI, and application to personalized and public health, social good and preventing social harm, future manufacturing, and disaster management. He's a fellow of the IEEE, uh, triple, IEEE, uh, triple AI, Triple AS, and ACM. His awards include IEEE TCSVC Research Innovation Award, University Trustee Award, 10-year award at the International Semantic Web Conference, Ohio State University Franklin College Alumni Award and the Ohio Faculty Commercialization Award. For several years through 2018, he was listed among the top 100 most cited computer scientists. Three of the four companies he has founded or co founded involves licensing his university research outcomes including the first semantic web com company in 1999, uh, 19, 1990, <laughs> that pioneered a technology similar to what is found today in Google's semantic search and knowledge graph. And the fourth company is at the intersection of emotion and AI. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Amit Seth. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you again, Ron. Um, so um, as you can see my title, I will um, talk about knowledge. I will talk about um, why uh, today's AI system will need explicit knowledge before uh, it will become um, more smart, before it will become capable of doing a lot more that we humans expect an AI system to do. Next. So we've been hearing um, diverse views uh, from the AI community. There are a group of people, uh, the, uh, there was a paper, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Big Data. There, there are also um, people who believe that deep, uh, we need a few more um, breakthroughs, but uh, otherwise deep learning can do uh, almost everything or will be able to do everything. And there are others um, who um, believe that uh, that would not be the case that uh, deep learning and or statistical AI is not panacea, is not going to solve all the problems we have. It is far incomplete uh, uh, compared to what we need, what we deserve, what we expect. Uh, and, and, and hence, um, you know, next please. And basically what we um, need is that we need these AI systems to be more responsive, more intelligent. And when you think about what we need from AI systems, uh, I happen to be in the camp that um, deep learning or any statistical AI technique is far from uh, sufficient. Um, uh, and, and it is necessary, it is helpful, uh, it is playing important role, but there's a lot more that would be needed. And that what, and and a lot of new innovations is going to come when we start um, using knowledge to, um, uh, to make these uh, AI systems smarter. So um, uh, Pedro in his very well-known uh, paper on machine learning said data alone is not enough. And uh, so the, along, you know, one theme of my talk is that um, data-centric uh, AI, statistical AI, is simply not going to be enough and that we need to um, use explicit knowledge uh, in building um, the future AI systems. 
the other theme of my uh, talk, a parallel theme and connected theme, is that um, uh, we need um, to raise uh, the level of intelligence uh, that the AI systems support. Currently, I'll argue that the AI systems really have very low level of intelligence. And that uh, for AI systems to be able to do uh, you know, more of the things that we humans want and need, uh, they will need to actually um, go up in the uh, kind of uh, uh, abstractions of uh, intelligence. And, um, you know, just one of many, many examples I can give is that uh, think about 2000 election. We had, imagine you have access to all the data uh, of social media, news articles, polls, whatever. Would it have predicted the outcome that, uh, that uh, you know, Hillary Clinton will lose? Uh, probably not. It would not. And in fact, all the predictions was that Clinton would win. Well, uh, I did. Uh, I did have a um, uh, you know uh, software I used. To, we had built called Twitteris, which became the commercial uh, you know product, and then the company called Cognovi Labs today, where uh, we did accurately predict uh, the outcome of the election. Uh, I had predicted 2012 election. I had predicted Brexit correctly. I had predicted some Senate elections, and I had predicted 2016 elections, and then. Um, in all of that, as I look back, uh, I was able to use very large amount of data. We, we could process millions and millions of uh, Twitter posts, for example, or any other uh, data sets. But um, there was uh, intrinsic uh, human involvement. Uh, my own understanding of election and how uh, you know voting systems work and how uh, you know in terms of the time, geography, demographics play the role. I remember looking at, for example, uh, urban uh, Pennsylvania versus rural Pennsylvania in making my call as to who will win the Pennsylvania. And there is so much of that kind of uh, domain knowledge, knowledge about the election that I had to employ to come up with my, with my outcome. This is something that today's AI systems don't have. This is what the AI systems uh, would need. Uh, and, and generally speaking, the humans uh, do not rely on the data alone. There's a lot more that happens. Uh, there is a theory where, uh, you know, humans uh, constantly apply their own knowledge and experiences in uh, coming up with whatever understanding they get or gain of the data. Currently, 11, bits per, 11 million bits per second are hitting your sensors. Uh, your, your sensory, uh, you know, um, uh, device, you know, your, your, our eyes, our ears, and so on and so forth. And um, when we in understand from what we are listening and hearing and watching, um, well, um, we are constantly using our knowledge of the domain, you know, and we are interpreting it. That kind of thing is not there in the AI system today. That's what we needed next. So current AI systems have um, classification, prediction, recommendation, language processing, text uh, translation, and so on and so forth. I'll argue that these are, uh, you know, kind of these these represent lower level of machine intelligence. These are these are uh, limited set of things that you can do. These are important uh, for certain applications, but they, um, you know, are, are are what you call as relatively simple things that you ask for AI systems. What else we need? Next. So um, what we have today is what you see on the left. You see, you know, um, a focus on a very narrow task. And it is illuminated well, and you know exactly what you're seeing. What we need is human-like broad spectrum behavior uh, for looking after humans, for making companions to the human. And in doing so, we will need um, high level of intelligence uh, that is broad, complex, and multifaceted. Uh, there is a, a theory of multiple intelligence, and it talks about a whole variety of intelligence that you have to, you know, that humans employ when 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 they function in the real world. We will need that, and there is a long way to go. But in that path, knowledge is going to play a very critical role. Next. So here are some of the um, uh, uh, high-level capabilities uh, or capabilities needed 
for high level of intelligence. That's abstraction, contextualization, personalization, analogy, and causality. I'm going to discuss just a little bit of these, uh, 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 some of the samples from these. Uh, my, my team works on all of these, but um, for the time we have, we'll take a few examples. Next. So um, we expect a lot more from AI system than what we have today. Um, as I said, deep learning um, uh, work on really fine text and, and, and they give a false sense of, um, uh, you know, uh, false sense of, kind of having a, accomplished very smart things, but they don't. Um, also, we need more fo better forms of machine intelligence. I mentioned that. Knowledge is needed. I already said that. Next slide, please. Among the things we need is to mimic human, human intelligence. We need to be able to reason, analogy, spatial temporal, causality. We humans are biased. And then uh, you want to serve a biased human? Well, you want to understand what biases that human has. And then decide whether you want to serve that bias or not serve that bias. That's besides the point. The point is that you need to understand that. Um, we need to understand uh, data in complex needs, and then uh, knowledge will play an important role. Next, please. Okay. So um, uh, I think I already covered much of it. Next, please. So look at the um, sentence on the right in the green uh, background. Zenadu quit graduate school to join a software company. When a human uh, hears that, the human is going to be able to, um, um, you know, make a lot of inferences. It, it, the human typically understands that uh, Zenadu is a living young, young human being uh, who was in graduate school because he quit graduate school. Um, to join a software company that is a need for a new employee. So there are a lot of things, there's a lot of undercurrent that we humans are able to, you know, gain. If today's AI system were to be exposed to the text on the right, they are not going to be able to, you know, infer and understand uh, all the things on the uh, left that the humans would be able to do. So, um, uh, While we know that deep learning systems have done amazing um, job in some of these natural language processing tasks, that the, what we have is far from what we call natural language understanding. Next, please. Uh, there is plenty of um, uh, uh, literature and plenty of uh, wonderful um, uh, you know, uh, position, uh, insights into the human brain and into the human intelligence and the human decision making. So, um, uh, in behavioral science, uh, behavior, behavior economics, uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman talked about system one uh, and system two. Uh, in uh, computer science and cognitive science, we talk about perception and cognition. In AI, we talk about statistical AI and symbolic AI. In uh, co uh, cognitive science, uh, they talk about bo top brain, bottom brain. Uh, this is similar to system two and system one at, at certain level of abstraction. And um, human activities involve both of these. We do, uh, co we do we, our brains are wonderful at uh, processing lots of, um, uh, you know, data. Uh, in our perceptual system. Uh, so this 11 billion bits per second that we gain, that's being processed on a very rapid basis in terms of understanding your surrounding, the objects you are seeing and so on and so forth. At the same time, we have this slow thinking uh, process, deliberative planning that requires, uh, you know, um, uh, th that is of different kind. What I see happening is that as we go along, we'll understand that knowledge and experiences, explicit modeling of them, and then including them with the AI systems of today, particularly the statistical AI system, will allow us to uh, support both of these better and to connect them better. 
in our uh, in our human brain, system one and system two processes of perception and cognitions happen uh, very well simultaneously helping each other. Knowledge will become a very important link to connect the two. Without that, that would that connection won't happen in the future. AI systems that support high level of intelligence. Next. Um, a few years ago, I had uh, developed a, um, uh, you know, I had a position paper, a vision paper, uh, a title that semantic, cognitive, and perceptual computing, a paradigm that shapes uh, human experience. There is a, there is a paper, there is a keynote talk. Um, but the point that I wanted to, um, you know, really talk about is that um, you see on the right hand side, at the bottom uh, right, you see there's all kinds of data. So in this case, we are talking about a patient. And we have all these uh, sensors that patients may have, uh, blood pressure and um, environmental factors that the patient is exposed to and um, a weight and so on and so forth. And um, uh, that is all data. At the end of the day, uh, what a patient is interested in, what a clinician is interested in is how well controlled is my disease. Let's say in this particular example, we are talking about asthma. And the asthma can be well controlled, not well controlled, very poorly controlled, whatever that is. And that we go through the level of abstractions necessary from that low level data to that high level of, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, understanding on which we can act. If you understand that your disease is not well controlled, then doctor has said to take this extra medication, control of uh, medica rescue medication for asthma. And you'll do that. Right now, as uh, a, one of the things that I portrayed in this architecture was to show uh, on the right hand side, you see, uh, you know, uh, various examples. It shows um, specific, explicit knowledge that get used along with statistical techniques to go from that data to actions, decision making, understanding. Next, next, please. So the knowledge come in variety of form, but two main form is tacit knowledge uh, and the explicit knowledge. And um, the current AI system, the, at least the so-called uh, uh, wave two AI system, or depending upon statistical AI, is largely uh, you know depend upon uh, tacit knowledge. Uh, they, they have patterns, and patterns have some meaning, but the meaning cannot be explicitly talked about. So. That uh, uh, tacit knowledge, while um, in a deep learning and in neural network system, uh, is playing important role, uh, it is uh, simply not surfaced. And because it is not surfaced, it is uh, not very useful for some of the things. For example, in human communications, uh, we use explicit knowledge and we refer to the explicit knowledge that you and I know so that I can commu effectively communicate uh, to you with you, right? So uh, we need to, uh, so, so, you know, again, this talk is going to uh, throw light on this explicit knowledge. Next, please. Next. And uh, uh, one of the interesting thing uh, to note is that uh, the kind of knowledge that we are going to have and they're going to need is going to come in many different forms. One of the best understood form of knowledge is what we call domain specific knowledge. You can see on the top right. And so, for example, I have a knowledge of a medical domain. I have a knowledge of, uh, you know, uh, cars and car scenes. I have a knowledge of a smart city. I have a knowledge of disaster concepts. Uh, and, and all that knowledge, um, you know, typically is modeled as a knowledge graph or ontology. And this is something we understand well. Uh, what we have argued is that we're going to, uh, you know, need knowledge of many different kinds, individual knowledge versus group knowledge. Uh, we'll need or collective knowledge, uh, regulation and law. So when I talk about autonomous vehicle, it's not just going to be about driving the car, but it is the car in the context of society and the physical environment. And you'll have to model that. Uh, you'll have to model common sense knowledge. You'll have to model social uh, norm-centric knowledge versus individual knowledge. An individual has, let's say, uh, you know, um, a culture. Uh, uh, you know, that individual's culture uh, knowledge will have to be modeled. So this is a, a challenging job, but 
Uh, we are making progress towards that. Next, please. So one other way I will, uh, you know, explain you in, in a little bit of depth is that um, uh, by looking at NLP versus natural language understanding, um, how uh, you cannot do uh, take the techniques that have worked so well with NLP for natural language understanding and why knowledge is playing or will play a central role in um, in in, under, in natural language understanding. Next, next, please. So here is a, a web forum. Uh, this is the web forum um, kind of data that uh, we had used in a project where we made something called what what is called as Lopremite discovery. So we analyze a whole bunch of uh, web forum data, uh, millions of posts, and uh, we ca we came to uh, a discovery that people who were using opioid were abusing buprenorphine, immunodimidine, a over-the-counter drug. Uh, in 10 to 20 times the prescribed dosage to manage the withdrawal side effect from the use of uh, you know opioid uh, but in the process we had to understand what are the uh, drug users what are the uh, you know um, you know yeah what, what what are the people who are abusing drug uh, talking about and in understanding all of them you come across very challenging text you come across the text called BU or BUP. You can see that underlined blue term BU. You can uh, come across the word Sabaxon. It is important to definitely understand that they mean the same thing. BUP, BUP or BUP is a slang or street name. Sabaxon or Sabutex is a brand name. And uh, the generic name of the drug is buprenorphine, which has certain features, which has certain properties. Uh, and, uh, and there are many other things you need to understand, uh, such as the route of administration, whether you're snorting, whether you're taking injection, all that kind of stuff. You, uh, you have to understand dosage, sentiment, um, variety of relationships uh, that are shown on the bottom left, uh, right. When you want to do this granular understanding, this is not what you get from a complex pattern. This is something that has to be unearthed. This is something. You know, and that a human decision maker in, in our case, uh, you know, epidemiologists need to be able to understand explicitly what this language says. Right. And, um, you know, there are many challenges that um, you have to face. For example, for Wendy, every one occurrence of buprenorphine in the corpus, there were 29, sorry, more 34 occurrences of all the different variations like bu, bup, subux, subutex, subaction. Now imagine the kind of recall you would have if you did not know that, if you did not have the explicit knowledge representation of the type shown on the uh, top left, right? So we need to really, um, um, uh, uh, we really need to um, go to, uh, you know, we need to really resort to this kind of uh, representation to be able to understand the, the language without, uh, and, and, and the argument is that a, Statistical learning method would not give you what you want. Next. So think about understanding the natural language. When you want to understand that, you are, are going to uh, employ, uh, you know, your understanding of uh, language structure and grammar, syntactic structure and grammar, uh, you, like, uh, like what you do in a past tree. You're going to apply linguistic knowledge, like what is captured in WordNet. You're going to apply uh, common sense knowledge, like what is captured in ConceptNet. You're going to apply broad, uh, uh, you know, general purpose knowledge, factual knowledge, like who is the president of the US right now, like what you may find in Wikipedia or Wikidata and Wikipedia. And you're going to use domain specific knowledge of a variety of domain, uh, medical domain, uh, pharmaceutical domain, uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicle domain, so on and so forth. All of these are being applied by human brain when we understand a natural language. Imagine what's happening today. Uh, today, uh, I think we are claiming that um, there is a uh, the NLP systems are doing wonderful. In reality, really not. Uh, what I would like to uh, you know share with you is that um, you know we have created artificial um, 
an artificially low level um, uh, evaluation strategies and test. Uh, what the best known is this glue or super glue, general language understanding evaluation. Basically, I would argue that there's hardly any language understanding going on there. It is fairly low level representation. Uh, and um, and then you, you keep a low level standard for saying, do you understand the language? And then you say you do very well, show 90% result or 92% results or, or something like that and say, oh, we are doing fantastic. Fine, but you know, you're doing fantastic with regards to very limited and low level task. We really need to think about high level task, uh, one what we call knowledge intensive language understanding. And uh, there is uh, work going along that line. For example, there is a system called Ernie or, or NoBert or, or we have, we have something called uh, 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 KIBert. And then what we are trying to do is to essentially uh, talk about uh, knowledge understanding, I'm sorry, language understanding at high level and come up with the test to really measure at that high level. Next, please. Here is an example, uh, you know, uh, of what would happen if you do NLP versus NLU in a uh, in a in a uh, little uh, chatbot. So the, the person asking, uh, tell me more about um, a bup. Well, the chat box says, I don't understand what that is. Uh, then say, uh, okay, I I don't understand. So the person says, uh, subutex. Sorry, he says I don't get it himself. Then he says, I meant buprenorphine. Now the system understands it because it has a very limited knowledge uh, of, of the domain. On the right hand side, the system has the knowledge of the buprenorphine and bup and subutex and subaxon being about the same. And not just that, um, it also has um, uh, you know, uh, a lot more uh, granular uh, information about let's say what buprenorphine does or what how it is used or uh, what are the problems using buprenorphine and you can see at the very bottom of the conversation that it says well this is what happens if you use buprenorphine right and and that really takes domain knowledge trying to understand all of the things you see on the bottom right from uh, using a statistical ai technique deep learning technique neural network training uh, is uh, is something that I don't know how to do that effectively. Next. Here is a, an example of uh, intelligence um, uh, that an asthma uh, uh, or lack thereof that an asthma uh, virtual assistant could have. On the left hand side, uh, you know, the user asks, um, you know, how is the weather today? today? And, um, uh, you know, the system uses a web service, goes to the um, uh, you know, uh, uh, weather.com or wherever and gives you the data. On the right hand side, the system has contextualization and personalization. So uh, the context is asthma. Personalization is what are the factors uh, that lead to the symptoms related to asthma for this patient. So when the student, when the patient asks, how is the weather today? Uh, it says, well, uh, the uh, ragweed pollen is high. Um, uh, or, or low, and then based on that, it gives you the recommendation, right? And because the system knows that um, personalization is about the system knowing that uh, your, um, you know, the, uh, the patient is uh, 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 symptomatic to red with pollen, right? Next, please. So, uh, in this building of this kind of conversation. Uh, you know, uh, uh, AI-based system uh, that, that supports uh, knowledge infusion uh, for language understanding. Um, it, the, it supports personalization, abstraction, and continuous contextualization. So in a, um, in a, in a conversation that is long running, what happens is that um, uh, you go from one uh, area of discussion to another area of discussion. For example, um, in a, uh, a chatbot or a virtual agent, you may have conversations surrounded, surrounding understanding how is patient doing today, today's symptom. You may, uh, and then later on it goes on to kind of, you know, um, understanding the doctor's order and uh, what should be done. And then uh, it may be about planning as to how can you maintain good health. So the context drifts or shift over the period of conversation. And you have to keep up with all of those things. Imagine again trying to 
you know, all what I what I'm arguing is that in doing personalization, having these abstractions, you need uh, to understand uh, uh, information and data at different level of representation, and having this context representation and changing context, you really need to have a substrate, uh, a, 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 you know, like a trellis on which you can train a vine, which is knowledge. Next. So, uh, 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 you know, there are many domains. Uh, I listed just a few of them that we work with uh, where um, we need more intelligence and, 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 and as a corollary uh, use of explicit knowledge. Next. So, uh, here I'm showing an example of uh, uh, driving. In this particular case, we had um, for the San Francisco Bay Area uh, uh, data or from the road network for the entire um, year. So billions of um, you know data points of uh, cars passing the road, how many cars per road in a given minute on a given road. Uh, and then we have uh, you know all the uh, traffic related uh, tweets filtered out, semantically filtered, uh, also from the say uh, that look uh, area. And then we are trying to connect. Uh, is there a tweet that is relevant to this traffic accident? So because of the traffic accident, uh, there is a uh, slowdown of traffic. You know, you only know from the network data, from the sensor data, that traffic is slow at, at this location. You don't know why it is slow. And uh, here, uh, the system connects to potentially relevant tweet that may say, oh, there's an accident um, on uh, the Golden Highway at the Viking, uh, you know, robots in uh, uh, in uh, Devlin and whatever those that text in black, black is on the top right. So to connect the slow traffic and accident, you are, uh, you know, you, you're, you're making this connection. However, this connection becomes possible uh, only because we use uh, multiple knowledge bases. In this particular application, we use three different knowledge graphs or uh, ontologies for smart uh, for transportation for um, smart city and for other other uh, weather and other things so for road networks and that allowed for the connection otherwise how do you build a, an ai system that has a, is a very good multimodal uh, and there is a stream of data for sensor data uh, and multiple sensor data and textual data like twitter data and you need to make a high quality connections correlations between them. How would you do that, right? So explicit knowledge plays a huge role. Next, please. The next thing is, you know, uh, a very important area of uh, analogy and, um, and abstraction. Uh, abstraction is what gives humans the ability to generate, generalize from the situation that uh, he or she has not seen before. And analogy making gives us conceptual understanding needed for abstraction, often we can, uh, you know, we can and create and say, "Oh, uh, this is similar to that I've seen." It's not the same, and you create analogies in your brain. It so happens that um, so so today's you know AI systems are pretty brittle, and they really can't generalize uh, from a few examples um, uh, to understand something. They need millions of uh, data points, and so there are there are efforts to go in uh, you know few short learning and zero short learning and things of that nature uh, i don't think that they are uh, going to be as powerful and effective without uh, you know explicit knowledge again uh, next please so you know the concept of abstraction is very very powerful on the right hand side there is a very old uh, um, a picture that i i put down where there is a specific cow uh, and the concept of cow to livestock to a uh, farm asset to asset and then wealth right so see how the things have moved from you know and our, our human brain does this fantastically well you might have some very low level information or data and you you know are transported to talking about some very high level concept or high level abstractions so uh, 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 so um, uh, and there are, you know, some examples here. You have Granny Smith Apple. From Apple, you go all the way to uh, health, right? Or um, and, and there is another one, creativity that I portrayed. This is a very powerful thing that humans do. 
and you really uh, you know if you want to build future uh, smart intelligent systems we need to figure out how to do this again in my view uh, uh, the the statistical AI systems are very very poor at this kind of stuff next please so uh, uh, you know and uh, those who do educational pedagogy uh, uh, have have argued that um, analogy is a very powerful way of learning uh, there is a lot of uh, literature on that from from in education but uh, we have not been able to build a good ai system uh, that does analogy yet so uh, here is a uh, an analogy uh, that are uh, one of my uh, somebody i know a professor at tennessee um, he uh, for uh, used in his biochemistry class um, analogy uh, and he asked his students to build analogy about biochemistry on the right hand side is a um, uh, you know uh, electron uh, chain system which essentially um, uh, results into creation of atp and basically energy transport me mechanism so um, so so uh, you know there is a electron channels that uh, lead to ultimately um, an activity that you know transfers energy from one form to another form and uh, you know, supplies the energy to the cell where it is needed. So the uh, electron transport that you have on the right hand side, somebody draws analogy in terms of pumping uh, the water from the well, where the uh, the string, uh, the rope, uh, plays the analogy uh, with the uh, electron transport mechanism. So in the in the body, and that analogy is very powerful to help you understand what's happening in a complex uh, you know um, uh, analogy uh, complex uh, uh, um, scientific concept that you're trying to convey on the right hand side next please so uh, these kind of things requires uh, you know uh, systematicity and the process constraints for kind of describe sequential uh, process and um, you know when you have to talk about variety of concepts uh, that form a sequence of steps in the in a process this is very difficult almost impossible um, to do if all you have is some sort of some patterns uh, some statistics on the data um, you really need some um, explicit uh, knowledge to be able to do that and you really need so so you know knowledge graph is the mechanism that we use next slide So here uh, I'm showing the uh, analogy that has been built to explain that analogy uh, uh, on the previous, uh, you know, um, uh, slide uh, from you know between the uh, pumping the water and uh, and, and the uh, uh, the thing that happens in the um, uh, energy conversion. And so there is a villager pulling rope provides energy. Electron transfer on transport chain provides energy. Rope is equivalent to electron, uh, you know, uh, transport chain. These are specific set of activities that you are trying to portray, and there is the whole process that you're trying to portray. Uh, I uh, I find it hard to imagine exactly how you can get this achieved using your uh, uh, your choice of deep learning algorithm. Next, please. So there are a whole variety of um, uh, you know high level knowledge that um, uh, that that we use uh, for uh, you know planning for for abstractions uh, you know representation for process knowledge and so on and so forth and um, they they will ultimately have to be modeled to and and supported and used in the AI system to get that high level of intelligence next please so here. Uh, you know, you, you use knowledge to think, compile relevant knowledge for abstraction and reasoning based on task and observational data, and that allows you to think. Then you abstract observations, uh, uh, you abstract observation data by mapping to a compiled knowledge, meaning doing thinking to form human understandable concepts. We call that abstract thing. Then you synthesize reasoning over the concept using relevant knowledge compiled during the thinking uh, phase resulting in action and then you execute action to enable the decision you you you, you convert the decision into um, uh, you know you, you decide and you act 
so these are some of you know, and these are the things that you must do all time and again. You do every day, every mom, you know, many many times in a day. Knowledge has central role to play in all of those things. Next, please. Now I'm going to uh, you know take a few minutes, just about ten minutes or so. Uh, to uh, give you uh, a little bit of a deeper view on uh, how do you, um, we talk about a lot of what's uh, and why. I want to talk a little bit about how uh, you actually incorporate knowledge in the uh, you know, current state of the art AI systems, statistical AI systems, and what does it do? One of the most important things uh, that, um, uh, where, where, uh, one of the most important reasons why we need explicit knowledge um, is to be able to explain. Uh, there was a report that uh, just uh, you know came out from IBM this year, where 91% of the company said they need and they want uh, the AI system to be explainable. So explainability is uh, going to be hugely important um, topic. Uh, trust um, uh, in AI system is uh, recently um, Steve Jobs said, uh, not Steve, sorry, uh, the the the, the uh, uh, CEO of Apple said that um, just this year that, uh, you know, the trust in AI system is pretty low and, and we need to uh, increase that. Without um, uh, without trust, technology will not achieve its objectives. Uh, uh, you know, so um, uh, experimentation is really going to be a, you know, very important area. It's already an important area of AI. Now, what happens is that uh, using, currently we are doing some decent progress in interpretability of the AI system. But uh, what we argue is that really you need this ex knowledge, uh, explicit knowledge to be able to explain what an AI system does. Let me talk, uh, let me say a little bit more about it. Next slide, please. So, you know, there are uh, deep learning models that, uh, you know, do parameter, parameter visualization methods. And they could highlight, for example, phrases in a text. And uh, in that sense, it provides interpretability. But um, there are, uh, you know, phrases that pattern recognition cannot detect very well. And um, knowledge traceability provides explanations on the model outcome in terms of the concepts that domain experts understand or the user understand. So we are increasingly being, building AI systems that is used by humans for to assist humans or in place of humans. And when we build these systems, we need to be able to explain. But not only that we need to be able to explain, we need to be able to explain in the terms that is meaningful to the uh, user or the expert. So one of the reasons why um, uh, some of the uh, deep learning system, let's, let's say, uh, you know, image classification system, have uh, performed better than humans, let's say radiologists. And yet, uh, clinicians would not use the system because um, there is no way for those system to describe how and why they came up with that particular recommendation or outcome. And without being able to explain really basis on not just what data, but what medical guideline are you making this prediction or a recommendation, right? So think about it. Uh, a, a clinician is not going to even react to work only data. He is going to use medical guideline. He is required to use medical guideline. He, is, he can lose his license if uh, uh, he is not, um, uh, you know, he can lose his license if he does not use medical guideline and explain why he has made that choice or decision, what on based on what. That medical guideline is the knowledge, is the domain knowledge, and that needs to be represented explicitly in case you want to generate an explanation from the data. Right? Next, please. And the clinicians will understand what you know uh, uh, explanation only if you phrase it in the con you know uh, in the context of that clinical guideline. If you if you just immediately come up with saying. I have this, uh, uh, you know, a lot of abundance of data and this data is meaningful and attention mechanism has shown that this data is relevant to this uh, outcome. So what? It doesn't say anything to the clinician. Why that phrase, that data, that reading from the uh, patient 
in the context of a given medical knowledge uh, clinical guideline re, you know takes you to be, makes you believe that indeed patient is suffering from this or that this is diagnosis or treatment uh, is this treatment has to be done right so there are many ways to so one of the things that we do is to incorporate or infuse knowledge in 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 uh, in, in ai tech current current crop of ai techniques largely we are talking about deep neural networks and so we wrote a paper called shades of knowledge infused learning and uh, we provided the classification of three uh, broad um, you know uh, classes uh, just for uh, pedagogy simplicity on the left you see shallow infusion what happens is that you uh, take the knowledge and dumb it down into the form that uh, in which data is being processed typically as a vector so basically you do embedding so knowledge graph embedding is a very well known uh, technique and people have used it very often and that is the way of infusing the knowledge unfortunately that uh, technique uh, while shows some better results compared to not using the knowledge um, uh, doesn't achieve a lot of things that uh, that that is necessary and in particular um, uh, it loses out on the richness of knowledge um, because ultimately when you represent knowledge you use a knowledge representation uh, in a, uh, uh, knowledge representation whether it is a triple or a, a or a graph or a label graph or a probabilistic graph there are many forms in which you represent knowledge that richness expressiveness of knowledge representation has a huge value and uh, essentially what has happened is that the expressiveness of deep learning uh, uh, you know data centric technique is very low so when you uh, dumb down the knowledge graph uh, you know the knowledge in the knowledge graph to uh, this text then you uh, lose out a lot so shallow infusion is uh, that now in the semi deep infusion what happens is uh, typically at the output layer uh, you uh, use the knowledge to modulate the parameter uh, and 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 the change the functions uh, attention for example based on the knowledge so different weights allow you to uh, you know focus your attention to different parts and uh, you are using the knowledge to guide your attention and that leads to uh, you know a, a potentially better outcome and that those are semi deep infusion techniques next please a couple of examples or let's just one or two examples so you no know, go back please yeah so um here uh, you see a text there and uh, you, is this is posed as a well known uh, classification technique you want to predict what is the mental health condition uh, uh, you know this is from a reddit mental health related reddit um, and uh, the system comes up with uh, you know is this mental health related 71% uh, for that the next would be um, uh, you know what mental health condition it says uh, depression actually the answer is wrong uh, the correct answer is ocd obsessive compulsive disorder why next slide please by the way uh, you know the uh, the highlighted terms are the ones that are uh, due to the attention matrix so here uh, is a technique where you use uh, can you go forward please yeah so here is a method uh, that shows um, uh, you know use of a, a knowledge infusion and essentially what it shows is that on the left hand side you see this dsm5 knowledge dsm5 is the documentation or or or, or medical uh, text uh, that um, are uh, used uh, kind of bible for all the mental health professionals this is what all the mental health professionals are trained on so we extracted knowledge from dsm5 and uh, created a uh, you know this correlation matrix um, uh, involving both the data uh, uh, you know the, from the post and the dsm file so you see that matrix there and use that to um, you know change the uh, uh, you know uh, functions there uh, weights and that leads to a higher confidence in mental health um, uh, you know uh, uh, you know that it is mental health related now you you are getting 0.82 uh, instead of 71 and this one is uh, resulting in predicting uh, the correct health condition ocd right so so it shows that the use of uh, knowledge um, and and what are the things that contribute that one of the interesting thing that happened is that lgbtq or or um, 
bisexuality came up uh, as um, uh, items that uh, received attention, uh, which was not the case in the previous example, uh, you know, without the knowledge graph. And um, that is that shows that use of the domain knowledge uh, can lead to uh, and, and like, would usually lead to better outcome, right? That the, the bisexuality and LGBTQ are knowledge are the knowledge relevant to OCD that were obtained from DSM-5 that were apl applied here uh, to get what you want. So it's a very powerful, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, support for for you know uh, the, the 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 value and need for knowledge here. Next, please. But now, uh, what you want to do is um, you want to be able to create explanation that is understandable for um, the for the humans. Uh, why is this OCD? Why is it not um, uh, you know uh, something else? Um, and uh, what happens here is that here I have. We have replaced uh, the terms by the appropriate types of classes. So there is a health leader behavior, and uh, you know there is a level of mood, and there is drinking involved, and the you know, and then there is a mention of OCD disorder, uh, you know, personality uh, personality disorder, and then disturbance thing, all this kind of stuff. So, so it says it gives you insight into um, uh, the kind of factors that got involved now remember these factors are not in the text so a data centric uh, mechanism is not going to get that right go to next slide next slide please yeah so see what is happening here is that uh, you are doing here uh, what is called as lifting uh, lifting of concept lifting of uh, so you have text here text has concept called bisexuality or uh, worthless or we get drunk right then what happens is that we are lifting that to the uh, uh, concept uh, framework. Uh, you know, we are mapping that to the concepts in the knowledge graph. And uh, that will allow you to have deeper and better and, uh, you know, uh, understanding of what that text is about and what is its relevance to what you are trying to do, such as understanding OCD. So OCD is a disorder in which people have obsessive, intrusive thoughts, ideas or sensations and make them feel driven to something repeatedly. So obsessive, intrusive thoughts, uh, these are the things. And what, what this shows you is that we found the support for uh, that uh, aspects of the definition. So I'm able to say that here's the definition of OCD and it requires, it, it talks about obsessive, uh, intrusive thoughts. And now look, uh, uh, understanding a natural language, understanding of this text, with that knowledge, uh, uh, domain knowledge allowed me to tell you that indeed those concepts are present in this thing, and hence I have classified this to be OCD. And this is how you got, uh, uh, you know. So this is the explanation, and it's an explanation. The uh, the, the definition is what a clinician, uh, you know, cares for. So this explanation is in that term. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, so here uh, it kind of shows you, uh, you know, in that same uh, study that I talked about uh, that um, as you infuse uh, different, uh, uh, you, know, tech, you know, kind of knowledge or, or other things, uh, what the improvements there are. So you can see on the left hand side, uh, the, the state of the art research uh, result in 2018 that used lexical and statistical features, but it had a very high false alarm rate, 30%. Then uh, somebody used TF-IDF features, so just some more features, really. Uh, but these, these are lexical and uh, syntactic features. Slight improvement, 3% improvement. But then you use contextual features, significant improvement, uh, you know, to 13% now, error rate from 30%. Then we used uh, contextual features weighted by DSM-5 knowledge hierarchy, 13% got down to 4%. Additionally, uh, we used um, uh, a, a, a additional knowledge of drug abuse. DAO, DAO stands for drug abuse ontology. And then finally, we used um, you know, additional uh, knowledge of uh, slang terms and all the, other, all the power of knowledge that we could potentially muster. And it took it down to 2.5% error rate. 
So you can show that the knowledge um, infusion, use of knowledge along with the data has substantial improvement. And I think this gives you a, a potential a way to say why uh, humans are so good at understanding no, you know, a language or understanding any kind of sensory input because um, uh, you know, we don't have that much of a, uh, that, that big an error rate as some of the statistical methods do. Uh, potentially, quite likely, because it, uh, humans apply the knowledge, right? Uh, uh, of course, the right human with the right knowledge, right? So it's domain expertise is necessary, and you are applying that. So um, uh, I think there's a powerful um, uh, support for understanding uh, why knowledge makes substantial improvement over statistical technique, uh, and why uh, knowledge uh, is critical in coming up with the explanation in the form that is useful to the end user or um, or the domain expert or like clinicians or like uh, you know uh, somebody building uh, 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 autonomous vehicle software that needs to perform uh, um, very accurately uh, next please so uh, we are continuing to um, you know play around with different um, uh, uh, you know, uh, architectures and different uh, and more sophisticated way of infusing the knowledge. So there is this thing called a deep infusion of the knowledge. And uh, what happens is that um, we uh, kind of uh, think of the knowledge in stratified terms. So earlier, you remember, I showed you a, uh, a whole, uh, you know, sort of a whole different kinds of knowledge, starting with syntactic, um, uh, uh, to lexical, to common sense, to general purpose, to domain, and and this is not a fixed uh, level. There can be more depending upon the, uh, the 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 intellectual activity involved. And 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 I showed you that you could um, you know um, yeah, incorporate the knowledge, um, the lexical knowledge. Uh, you could incorporate the uh, common sense knowledge. We built a, a system called KIBert where uh, it uh, infused. Um, Lexical knowledge from WordNet and common sense knowledge from ConceptNet, and showed that it 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 it, it improves upon the attention, uh, uh, you know, without the knowledge. And uh, now, you know, we would like to add to it the um, um, uh, the the domain-specific knowledge and and show how much further improvement we can get. So the point here is that. Uh, you know, just like deep learning, learning system is a layered learning system. In if you're talking about images, you earlier start with pixels and very low level features of image, and go down to a little bit, you know, modest level of uh, uh, abstractions like uh, texture and color, to understanding of objects and something, you know, very high level that is uh, what you're looking for from a from a model. Well, uh, with respect to different. Um, uh, layers in your uh, architecture, you could uh, be, uh, uh, you need to understand what those layers do, and then you need to infuse the knowledge of the right kind at that layer, and that you, um, uh, you know, then you lead to uh, deeper understanding. Uh, what we are trying to also do is to kind of take some um, uh, inspiration. Um, uh, the neuroscience has not progressed enough to, uh, you know, um, fully understand uh, exactly how the uh, you know brain works uh, i think we are far from it as uh, neuroscience nurses will uh, tell there was a, there's a big uh, you know um, uh, kind of a panel that um, uh, montreal ai guys put together and there was a panel on neuroscience and ai and um, you know i, I think um, majority neuroscience and say uh, you know admit that there's a lot more to go and I'm not so much interested in understanding individual neurons, although we have now recently learned just last week, there was a paper that each of the neurons is far more complicated than, um, you know, uh, what it has been talked about in the past. And that's just neuroscience. Correspondingly, what I would like to say is that the neural network architecture that we have today are uh, toys, uh, are very uh, simplistic, are, um, you know, the neurons uh, that we model is, uh, and the perceptron is, uh, uh, incredibly simplistic um, if you want to get the uh, compared to uh, human brain and uh, enhance uh, the plan to go to the human level of intelligence uh, so there are many things that we'll have to think about we may think about improving the uh, complexity of uh, 
uh, neurons and perceptron model by infusing the knowledge and retain knowledge in that. And that will be the way of doing about going about uh, thing and or and we need to uh, talk about uh, the loops um, that happen in the understanding uh, 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 where you go to high level of abstraction abductive deductive cycle that uh, uh, that that cognitive scientists talk about uh, and uh, we need to talk about uh, the fact you know uh, the thing that um, in our brain from the uh, from the perceptual system to cognitive system. Uh, you know, we go to different levels of abstraction and we employ different kinds of knowledge. For example, uh, we may, at a lower level thing, we may be applying our spatial knowledge as to where we are in the space. At a high level, you know, and the level is kind of, you know, depends on you define the level, what you mean by level. But high level of knowledge, uh, you're talking about a very specific knowledge about the domain for which you're going to make a decision, like say clinician or, or, or autonomous vehicle and so on and so forth. So uh, there is, you know, uh, uh, what going on uh, in my group, and I'm sure others would be interested in working on these things too, called, you know, deeper infusion of knowledge. But uh, the most important point to take away is that um, I see the future systems who are going to uh, strongly integrate uh, the, uh, the, the the tacit knowledge with explicit knowledge, uh, the statistical AI with, um, uh, you know, symbolic AI and the in creation of this new symbolic uh, computing system. Uh, and and basically, I would I, I feel confident that um, uh, uh, knowledge, explicit knowledge, and its exploitation would be a hallmark feature of uh, building the uh, neuro uh, neuro symbolic computing systems uh, of tomorrow. Next. So uh, to conclude, then, um, you know, DARPA talked about three waves of AI. And they talked about uh, the first way of AI, uh, you know, and, and pe some people may call that uh, symbolic AI, uh, 1980s and 90s. Um, uh, I remember, uh, you know, having a DARPA project in 1988-89 for integrating AI system with uh, database systems. Uh, and in those days, in AI systems, we used to talk about uh, interpretive logic was the main, uh, you know, um, basis for knowledge representation for building AI system. We used the uh, expert, expert system, which is rule-based, or you know, there's a prologue that then interpreted style of learning to uh, a system that was developed called LDL for compiled style of learning. And if, as the, those systems um, process, uh, you know, do the reasoning, they need facts or knowledge from database. So how do you supply the knowledge from the database efficiently to those systems, uh, interpreted to compile? Uh, that's the kind of work that we did in those days. But th those are the days of handcrafted knowledge. Uh, uh, I, I myself remember building uh, an expert system uh, for a chrome plating of aircraft, military aircraft landing gear. So hand coding no uh, rules by reading the um, um, a text with a book on that and then having the expert uh, you know, verify the rules that we had encoded and then running the expert system. Then came uh, the second uh, wave, uh, the also called as statistical learning, uh, and uh, really uh, they they have done, um, um, I guess, wonderfully well. Uh, you know, the, the AI is everywhere, and um, it is thanks to uh, machine learning of uh, the first decade of this century and uh, deep learning. Uh, you know, starting 2012. Uh, and uh, it has done some things very well. But remember what I said early in my talk, they do like narrow activity. And in the narrow activity, well-defined, uh, limited uh, activity, they have done fantastic. They can beat humans in doing those activities. But the next one, uh, which also some people may call it neuro symbolic computing uh, explanation, uh, uh, then you will uh, just... Um, uh, you know, uh, this needs uh, contextual adaptation. The ARPA used the word contextual adaptation. Now, I um, uh, kind of describe in my own way what I mean by contextual adaptation, and I also emphasize the explanation very well. The system understands why, uh, you know, it is making that decision. And I argued that uh, explicit knowledge is going to play an uh, uh, indispensable uh, role in uh, you know building these explainable AI systems, which uh, everybody seems to want. Now that everybody uh, seems to see that AI is very important for them, uh, there is a there is a um, 
you know, CEO of Bain Capital who said every company is an AI company, right? Um, so that's tremendous uh, interest and of course, uh, huge hype. Uh, uh, and that um, even knowledge graph term is considered to be a hype uh, now at the, at the top of the hype curve in, in, in uh, DARPA. But the next thing, uh, you know, and that it may be or may not be, but um, the next thing is that um, uh, to deliver the, uh, you know, promise uh, of AI, we need to combine uh, both the knowledge and the um, statistical learning techniques uh, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, build these more, more intelligent systems, these systems that represent high level of human uh, intelligence. When a chatbot uh, talks to human, uh, it needs to have, um, uh, you know, deeper understanding of human emotions. It needs to have empathy. Uh, and many of these things will have to be built future in the uh, systems. And because humans use explicit knowledge um, to communicate with each other uh, in, in a very prominent way, uh, the same way when the um, uh, AI system has to communicate or assist a human, the AI system will have to be built on the top of explicit knowledge. And so, uh, on, and uh, one of the interesting things uh, that my group does is to, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and the AI Institute is that we uh, learn from broad variety of uh, disciplines, neuroscience, cognitive science, behavioral science, behavioral economics. In fact, just this year, we hired two new faculty uh, in neuro, uh, uh, at the intersection of neuroscience and AI. Uh, so the, uh, they are part of the AI Institute, but uh, we closely work with uh, uh, Institute of Mind and Brain and, uh, you know, psychologists and cognitive scientists and neuroscientists in, uh, in, in our university uh, uh, at multiple, you know, in multiple centers and, and institutes. Uh, so we also, I work with a colleague, um, a long time, uh, you know, partner in my research, His, her name is Valerie Shellen. She's a psychologist, cognitive scientist. And, and of course, you know, some wonderful ideas have come from behavioral economics. So these are just some of the things that we take inspiration from. So with that, uh, um, uh, the next slide is just a, a thank you note. If you briefly show, and then we can, uh, uh, I'll post the presentation online, which will have some backup slide with a lot of details. Um, of course, uh, thanks to a uh, lot of funding, um, uh, currently, we have about 20 funds, projects funded at the intersection of AI and whole variety of disciplines, smart manufacturing, neuroscience, um, uh, public health, uh, medicine, and uh, uh, nursing, and so on and so forth, and, and social sciences. And uh, just a couple of them that are relevant are listed here. And some of my students um, uh, uh, who helped me with the, uh, specifically putting together these slides. So uh, thanks to them. All right, so I am uh, going to pass on to Rong now, I believe. And, uh, you know, um, thank you for Rong. Rong, thank you for inviting me. I hope uh, it's been useful. I've just taken over a, a, an hour and uh, happy to take any calls or talks. Uh, yeah. Talk. Yeah, Amir, thank you very much for this uh, insightful speech. So now we are uh, uh, starting the Q&A session. So uh, audience, uh, please now enter your questions in the Q&A window. And in the meantime, uh, Amit, I have uh, one question for you. Um, are knowledge graphs ready to keep pace with deep learning? Yeah, so um, the, um, the deep learning, um, uh, machine learning, if you may recall, got a lot of people interested. And deep learning also got a lot of people interested. And um, the number of people working on deep learning uh, far outstrips the number of people working on knowledge graphs and uh, that scientific technique. So uh, even though uh, ontology and knowledge graphs are not new concepts, the old concept, <clears throat> the rate at which they developed uh, has been somewhat slower. And biggest problem uh, has been the tooling. So, you know, uh, there have been Vika toolkit for machine learning. And there are all these deep learning toolkits available for us, PyTorch and so many other things. Now, um, that has made deployment of uh, AI techniques uh, much easier. If you compare with that, the knowledge graph techniques, are, you know, the, 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 the tools necessary to build knowledge graph has been um, uh, far more limited. 
uh, one of the projects that I have actually is about building a knowledge graph. It so happened that when I did my second company, uh, this was the first company that is web-based semantic search using knowledge graph. And we have pattern filed in 2000 or in 2001. So pattern was filed before the well-known uh, paper on semantic web, uh, which had knowledge graph and which used knowledge graph for uh, search uh, and for you know other things like showing info box that Google shows. But um, uh, problem has was that knowledge graph, if they're manually built, uh, then they can't keep up with uh, the uh, pace of innovation in the deep learning where you're massing of data and all this algorithm and uh, high-end computing available. So that is changing, but has not changed. However, there's one advantage that the knowledge graph people have, and is that humans have collaborated, what you call as collective intelligence to create knowledge that can be easily tapped and convert into useful knowledge graphs that can be used in the neurosymbolic company system. So people have written, done WordNet by hand, ConceptNet by hand, Wikipedia by hand, Wikidata is updated by hand, um, uh, UMLS is generated by hand. All of this is done by hand by a lot of people already. They are, dead, they are there to be exploited. So on one hand, for many uh, AI systems, many sources of knowledge are already available to create and modify the knowledge graph necessary for those AI system. Yet some more work is needed uh, where we need to have tools to build the dynamic knowledge graph dynamically. This knowledge is not static, so they need to keep on changing. And the tools need to be able to support that. So that work is still uh, a following and it will take, I think, another two, three, four years before we have something even more solid. But uh, so I would say largely yes, but not exactly. Not fully. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Now we have uh, questions in the Q&A chat. Um, I don't know if you can see that. The first one is, um, where would you classify the capability of IBM Watson? Is it analogy intensive? Well, I mean, uh, the uh, Watson did use, uh, you know, DVPedia, as we all know. And so uh, in, I give credit to Watson for realizing uh, the importance of uh, exploiting knowledge. I mean, if, because, because the Jeopardy, for example, is very fact-based in a way, uh, and the facts are there uh, uh, represented in some form that can be transformed into the form that your Watson uh, system can use, uh, clearly um, uh, their use, uh, although eventually I understood their use was limited, but their use was refreshing, and that was very important. And um, um, I have uh, personally uh, four, five, six PhD students, former PhD students who have worked for IBM in Watson and Watson Health. And so I have some, you know, of course, you know, some, some, you know, continuous kind of understanding while Watson was very hot uh, to about what's happening there. And yes, I think that uh, Watson, uh, you know, um, uh, many efforts in Watson and Watson Health. Uh, uh, did uh, exploit and try to exploit knowledge, uh, knowledge in uh, you know and knowledge graphs. Uh, however, um, not all. So um, uh, I think that uh, the Watson um, effort was really um, done before we have now better understanding of how to this whole thing about knowledge infused learning that I talked about today is more recent uh, than uh, um, a Watson effort. So during the time of Watson, the best that was done was very loose coupling of a variety of other AI techniques for recommendation. Basically, ultimately, it was primarily a recommendation system. Um, uh, the, 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 the use of knowledge was very loosely coupled kind of thing. And so the, the, the power that you gained from knowledge was also very limited. In that sense, um, uh, uh, yes and no again answer is a nuanced answer. Um, uh, it is, uh, um, I would say that uh, some of the creators of Watson uh, clearly knew the value of knowledge, but a lot of systems that I saw them being built um, uh, for, you know, they had uh, Watson uh, health for, uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, pharmacogenomics, no, so pharmacovigilance, for example, or they had Watson health for, you know, variety of market verticals. Some had uh, more knowledge, others had very little knowledge. 
And one of the reasons for that is something I'd like to uh, you know, explore, uh, uh, explain. Uh, it is very important, uh, largely. Um, the, you know, today, uh, if you look at all the National Science Foundation aff funded efforts in AI, uh, you know, um, uh, workforce development is a very big thing. One of the interesting things I, I have observed for a long time is that the amount of education that we give to our students uh, about knowledge and use of knowledge in building a system is minuscule, maybe less than 10% of amount of the knowledge and training uh, 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 we give to our students uh, uh, in uh, teaching them machine learning and deep learning. So, uh, so, so if you want, so my proposition is both are equally important. One is not more important than the other. And that uh, unfortunately though, uh, you know, in, in, in workforce development, um, uh, I, I, you know, we have done uh, a ridiculously uh, small amount of effort in training the students for uh, what it would make to build this more intelligent AI system. Uh, it, it may be justifiable because uh, people were, uh, you know, picking lower hanging fruits uh, and, they, <laughs> you know, so, okay, they were happy with some recommendation and classification and so on and so forth. And for that, the AI system did, you know, the, 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 the statistical system did very well. So they were we all went for that and they got good jobs if you know machine learning, deep learning and choose the right algorithm. <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Here's a, a very good related question. What should be the objectives of AI systems? Should it be to emulate human capabilities or augment human capabilities? Oh, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a softball question. This is a wonderful question for me. Thanks for asking me that. So in 2008, I had given a keynote and I had also a paper called Computing for Human Experience. And uh, in that, um, I had uh, portrayed the different visions of AI. On, in that picture, on the left-hand side, uh, the vision of AI was the Minsky, Marvin Minsky vision of AI, where AI is replacing human. And then there were um, uh, other visions of uh, you know, um, uh, uh, by by uh, uh, um, Ted, um, by um, I forget I'm forgetting all the names uh, on my mind. By Mark Weisner, competing for 21st century related to ambient intelligence, where uh, sensors are around. Another vision for human computer symbiosis. So there have been uh, community science. Uh, uh, you know, not hardcore AI, but com com community science influence. Uh, AI visions. And on the right hand side was what I called computing for human experience. So my personal uh, vision was extrapolation of what Mike Weisner and others had said in that I felt that AI system is there to uh, not at all replace human. Uh, and, and on the low level task, they can replace human. That's not a big deal about it. If there's a repetitive task, they replace human, that's fine. But I am really interested in that uh, part of the AI where the AI system is there to make human life better. To when I say improving the experience of human, I want I mean that I want human to be having more entertainment. Entertainment. I want human to have better health. Uh, you know. So 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 if, and the health is a very good example. My interest is you know you're not impressing you know you you. You're not, you're not going to use AI to replace human for human health. You are going to use AI to assist human to, you know, keep better health. So I came up with a, 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 a initiative called uh, Augmented Personalized Health, where you use all kinds of sensory data, all the biosensors, all the patient-generated health data to uh, kind of uh, monitor, appraise, and manage disease and we have done it we have done use that for um, asthma for we are doing it for diabetes we are doing it for um, uh, uh, hypertension we are doing it for uh, training the uh, you know parents of autism so we are doing all these things in the context of virtual health assistance and um, other things which use a lot of sensory data and a lot of uh, you know in, you know the interactions with people but the objective is to improve human health so it is to improve the human life and human experience that is what I'm interested in. That, that is a form of AI I'm interested in. 
Yeah, thank you very much. OK, now thank you again for delivering this insight for a uh, keynote. So we now conclude this session. Thank you very much. Bye.